The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Should animals have rights? Does your cat have a case? Do you have a duty to your dog? Are either of those animals actually yours? There are groups now campaigning to establish legal personalities for the creatures who share our world, claiming our current attitudes to animals will soon seem as out of date as the way our forefathers regarded people of different ethnicities. But what will this mean for farmers, for horse racers, for those who have pets? And if a cow has a right to life and liberty, what about a flea? Is the world ready for animal rights? The why? So, I mean, the question is, how far do you go with all of this? I mean, should animals have the same rights as human beings? Yeah. Well, I mean, clearly not, because they can't vote, they can't buy a house. Well, yeah, but you could uh, say that about a lot of people in society who may not be able to afford a house, who may not be able to X, Y, Z, and yet we still give them rights. We don't insist that people have to have particular capacities mm. to vote, So do should we? I own my cat? That's, I mean, that that, ah. that that question of ownership. Look, my cat, I have but, to say... do you own your well, cat? I, well, well, no, I think my cat owns me, actually, to be honest with you. Well, no, I mean, so I woke up this morning and he was lying right next to me. He was purring away. He seemed very happy. And when I'm sitting in the TV, in front of the TV in the evenings, and he's sitting on my lap and I'm stroking him, he seems... He seems, you know, as though life is pretty good to him. I, I, yeah, but that's that's the attitude of the tyrants down the ages, isn't it? Yes. No, the, the peasants are fine. They seem happy. It's fine. Well, I don't know. He seem, he does seem happy. I'm not, I'm not quite so sure they were. So, I mean, and where do you, so like all of these things, you know, you've, I mean, there's a difference, isn't there, between having rights and protecting them. So we, we want to look after yeah. animals. We want to protect them and make sure that they... Uh, have a decent life, unless, of course, we're killing them and eating them. Well, there is that's uh, the, the problem, isn't it, fundamentally? Mm. We use them, not just eat, killing and eat. I mean, we, we kill them and make, turn them into leather, or we do all these kind of things. And there are plenty of people in society who don't think we should be doing that. Yeah. And then you made, we, in the introduction, we mentioned horse racing. So my wife loves riding horses, and she would argue that horses like it, you know, enjoy it. Uh, not horse racing, perhaps, but, um, you know, galloping across horse, the... Horse riding. Well, may, maybe horse they do. We can't the, ask them. The, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. There's a difference, I think, though, isn't there, between horse riding and horse racing? So, again, of all of this is quite nuanced. I mean, horse racing, you know, mm. they're getting they're getting uh, whipped. They're jumping over. Their, and, you know, some people say, well, that's great because horses like to race. But, uh, yeah. Well, how, we just don't know. Is, we just how don't we know because they never exactly. answer. Exactly. Yeah. But, but in society, as I say, we don't necessarily disenfranchise people because of their limited abilities to do particular things, you know, even talk to us. We don't then say, oh, well, you're no longer a human being, do we? So I think it's really mm. very difficult. So it's so difficult. Do we just not bother with it? I mean, do we, isn't it just fine to say, look, so long as we, you know, we're not cruel to animals, you know, what really does need to change? I mean, because, I mean, if you, if you started to go any further... Uh, it, it's a can of worms, isn't it, Roger? Well, I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I think that a lot of people say, well, unless you have actual rights, people will do anything they feel like. Yes, some people will be kind and humane, but other people won't. And, isn't that and, what the RSPCA is for, though? You know, well, yeah, but, that, but that's like a kind of, you know, we, we are coming in to try and help, but it, it, you're still not covered. I mean, there's a famous case of a police dog mm. who got stabbed in some incident, and the only thing they could charge the person with who did the stabbing was damage to property, and yeah. everyone felt mm. this was an outrage. So yeah. I think there are... That there are certainly areas that need to be explored, and we've got someone who can tell us about that, and that's Dr. Stephen Cook, Associate Professor of Political Theory at the University of Leicester, who joins us uh, now. So, so Stephen, or Steve, I think I think we can call you Steve. So let's let's get to that level. Let's get to that level straight away. So uh, we just asked the question about you know how far these animal rights should go. I mean, obviously, animals can't have the same rights as humans. That is crazy because they, you know, they can't go to school. They can't own a, own a house. Uh, they, they can't get a job. So, I mean, so that raises the question, if we were to offer more in the way of rights to animals, where exactly would you draw the line? I said it's a difficult question because it will depend on the kind of animal that we're talking about. And I agree. I don't think animals should have exactly the same rights as as humans, but we also don't think that all humans should have the same rights, right? So my my children don't have the right to vote yet, um, at least not all of them. Um, and it'd be the same for non-human animals. It would depend on the kind of interests they have. So I think rights are grounded in interests and different non-human animals have different kinds of interests. Some have more of an interest in um, control over their environment. Uh, for example, if their habitat really matters to them, 
or if they're quite sophisticated animals like uh, orangutans that like to use their environment and do lots of free moment, free roaming around it, um, use the plants and leaves for self-medication and things like that, then they will have different sorts of rights than like a mouse would have. Um, so yeah, it will depend. But I mean, also, doesn't it depend on their their ability to conceive things? I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to say that a flea or a wasp has the same rights as an orangutan, but how can we get an idea of what they do perceive, how intelligent, how what capacities they actually have? Yeah, these are these are questions I like to leave to uh, to scientists because I'm a, I'm an armchair philosopher. <laughs> I like to stroke my chin and look out through my office window meaningfully, but not do any of the sort of dirty empirical scientific work. Um, but there's there's lots of techniques that scientists use to find out the level of of consciousness that non-human animals have. For example, there's a, a common uh, test known as the mirror test. It's a little bit controversial, but it's been going for a long time. Um, and it measures whether an animal has a sense of self. And to do this, uh, a scientist will make a, a mark on an animal's body and then put a mirror in front of them. And if the animal can then react and spot that the mark is on themselves, they start touching their own body where they see the mark, it gives them an idea, or gives us an idea that they perceive themselves. Um, and that test has been successfully carried out on, uh, the first animal that was carried out was Happy the Elephant in the Bronx Zoo. Uh, very badly named elephant, unfortunately. But it's since been replicated with all sorts of other species. Um, dolphins, it's very tricky to do it with with uh, animals that don't have limbs um, that can touch themselves, but it's done with dolphins, even zebrafish, um, some birds, um, and many of the sort of the higher primates will, will be able to do this kind of thing. So your uh, analogy of, you know, comparing it to children, so we have a, is a good one, I think, because... Because we protect our kids, don't we? And mm. so if we thought the same way about animals, and in lots of cases we do if it's a, if it's a pet. So Roger was asking the question, should we actually own pets? And I, you know, just before you came on, I was saying, well, you know, I started my day lying in bed and my cat was lying his head on the pillow, purring away. He seemed pretty happy with his lot in life and generally does. If, you know, the purring of a cat is a mark of happiness, let's assume it is. Uh, he's a very happy cat, uh, but he's getting protection in the same way that we protect our kids. So, I mean, if we thought about it, you know, it extended that to other animals, that's not a bad way of looking at it, is it? But, but, but I was making the point, Steve, that actually if you transfer that kind of language to a century or two ago, the way people would have talked about ideas like slavery oh they're happy that's fine we they're not really responsible we can deal with them i mean that's a worrying kind of parallel yeah. isn't it but i don't think they were happy yeah they were happy. yeah well i mean i think it's conceptually possible for there to be a happy slave but that still wouldn't make slavery morally permissible right <laughs> um so that's the sort of i think that's the thought that's going on here and I, i've got to do quite a lot of sympathy with that idea now i think you're right your cat probably is happy it's living a nice life uh, and there's quite a lot of disagreement within animal rights uh, theory within the field about whether or not the rights of animals permit ownership of them. And I used to think it was it was potentially possible, but I'm I'm less convinced now. Um, what, why don't you think it's possible to to own? What, what, what's the what's the problem with that ownership so, principle? Well, so if you look at uh, non-human animals at the moment, particularly pets, and it's you often find if you read the the sort of um, industry magazines of veterinarians, you will often find articles where vets talk about. Um, a term they've actually had to coin as convenient euthanasia. And so although many of us love our pets... So and convenient often, euthanasia? I just wanted to establish what that... Yeah, so that's that when uh, someone just, just decides that their pet is no longer convenient for their lifestyle. Perhaps they bought a new sofa and the hairs don't match it, for example, or they've quite often they've got a new partner who doesn't like their pet or is allergic to something, they're allergic to their pet or they're moving house because they've got a new job. They will ask their vet to put their animal down. No, right. well, that's, that, that is a violation of the rights of the animal. That's, I mean, clearly, yeah, so that, there's, yeah. yeah. There's no, there's no law against that. But some, some theorists think even if have animals have rights, um, and it was possible to reconcile sort of property ownership with them having a right, having rights, it would still put them in a in a position where they're subject to domination. That um, it would allow us so much control over their lives um, that it would be possible for them to be quite seriously harmed. Um, but I mean, doesn't that become so? Again, getting back to kids, though, it, uh, you've got control over your over your over your children, haven't you? And, and you, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to harm yeah. them or have them put down. 
even though I'm sure we've all been at the stage where we're thinking, well, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but we, but but, we but don't. Also, also, until very recently, it was it was fine, legally speaking, may even be in some areas, to, to hit your kids. I mean, that's that's been a thing. And before that, you know, going back 200 years, it was fine to beat your wife. So, I mean, those that's the kind of analogies, I suppose, if we're saying it's fine to kick your cat. Yeah, and it might be something to do with the attitudes that are associated with the idea of ownership as well, that, that there's a claim that, that it's your property and you can do what you like with it. Now, I think there are there are ways that you can modify property rules. So, I mean, for example, someone might be able to own the Mona Lisa and still be prohibited from destroying it. Um, so there are different ways you can think about property ownership. But I think there is something about the attitude of ownership that might be problematic here. And there's a different way we can think about our relationship with companion animals. And that's much more like uh, the child, parent or familial relationship, um, or as a more as a sort of a guardian or a ward uh, that gives you some kind of legal duties um, and some rights uh, regarding your ward, um, but it's not quite the same way of thinking about the relationship you have. Um, there's much less um, idea that it, it's something that's an instrument for you to use, um, like a, a form of property, and something that you instead have to care for and are required to care for by law. So that would be the kind of model that I think is probably more appropriate in an animal rights world uh, for thinking about ca- companion animals. But how would that then work for farmers or, or something like that? Because that's not a companion; that's a, a, a that's that's an instrument of your business. Well, that, that's a that's a different that's a completely different kettle of fish, isn't it? Just finishing on because I think we do, we should go there. But just finishing off this point about companion animals, so that would just be corrected, wouldn't it, by some changes in legislation? Just being a bit more specific about uh, what you're what you're compelled to do mm. uh, if you if you have a pet. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's all that needs to change, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We, we just, we, I mean, we have those legal frameworks already in place um, and they've been used for some non-human animals in the past, uh, particularly where animals have been left, for example, uh, gifts in people's wills. Um, and they have sort of legal frameworks set up to look after them and, and pursue their interests. Mm. Well, let, let's let's move on to that. The other question, because I mean, there's a lot of emotion in this. We love our animals, or at least we mm. theoretically do. Uh, it's not an own, not so much an ownership thing as a companionship, almost a relationship going on there. But where, Steve, you have this issue of. Uh, animals being a functional in a business or, or, or part of your farm or, you know, the donkey that carries your luggage or whatever it is, the same thing doesn't apply, does it? Uh, well, it might do. Now, in an animal rights view, the, the, at least the position I adopt is that rights are grounded in the interest, the very serious interests of a non-human animal. And that would rule out actions that would severely um, set back those interests. So the interest against being made to suffer uh, for, for animals that have an identity that persists over time and interests connected with the future desires, future directed goals, you know, that then that would give a right against being killed. Um, but we can, so that would rule out, you know, farming non-human animals for food, killing them, bringing them into existence, killing them, uh, using them in ways that cause them to suffer and so forth. But it might permit uh, relationships where, we gain a sort of mutual benefit that doesn't violate rights. So there are a lot of animals that quite enjoy work um, and get a lot out of it. They're capable of flourishing, living good lives with us. Um, And I think they might have something akin to labor rights that protect their interests in those kind of relationships. Can we be sure they're enjoying it? How do we know they're enjoying it? Yeah, and can you give us an example of of something that an animal might enjoy that could be perceived as work? So, for example... um, like a, a potentially a guide dog or something like that, or a guard dog, uh, a therapy animal, perhaps. Um, even some animals uh, that that might uh, you know, might engage in sort of leisure pursuits with them while I, um, riding horses. Perhaps I'm less convinced because the process of training a horse to be ridden is quite often quite brutal. It's called breaking a horse in for a reason. Um, but but you know you can see cases like that. There's a world of difference, isn't there, between training a horse to go uh, in horse races, for example, and a horse that you just hack through the countryside. I mean, a world of difference. Yes, I think so. Yes, there is. There is. Um, so I, I think those kind of relationships, the, 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 the non-human animal could potentially flourish. There's particularly things like like a, a guide dog or a guard dog or something like that. Um, and in those cases, I think they should be entitled to you know, working time regulations, um, health benefits, maybe the prospect of a happy retirement, things like that. But that's that's a very difficult thing to legislate, though, isn't it? Because people would say, OK, maybe that's true for a horse, potentially for a cow or a sheep, mm. a chicken, though. I mean, pff, you know, it, it kind of 
the the distances you go with the principle then comes back to the problem of definition of uh, of the animal and its its position legally speaking. Yeah, I mean we know a lot about the kind of minds of non-human animals, and we're learning a lot more as our as our science gets better uh, in finding these things out. Uh, but we fundamentally know an awful lot about them because we wouldn't be able to domesticate them and live lives with them if we weren't able to pretty accurately predict how they were thinking a lot of the time and how they were feeling. Um, the, the whole idea of domestication depends upon that, um, and it's been very successful. So I think we can we can make lots of good inferences about what's going on in an animal's mind, and we're always we're going to get things wrong sometimes, but we can have we can be pretty confident about you know what it is that makes a chicken's life go well for it, and what makes it go bad for it, um, and and from that develop a set of rights that might protect it against uh, having its interests. But I mean, Seriously, we so a, a lot of these animals. So nine million cattle in uh, in the UK, I think, is what one number mm-hmm. I saw. Uh, maybe a bit more than that. It's uh, that's a lot, and they're only there for one reason, aren't they? Mm-hmm. You know, and and well, I mean, they're either there to be milked. Well, there's two or, reasons: or, they get milked or, or they get or killed. To be eaten. Exactly. So uh, I mean, is that? I mean, you'd, on the on you know, on the surface, that would seem to be a violation of their rights. You know, they have the right to Absolutely. stay alive. Absolutely, I think it is. <laughs> right, so we, so, we shouldn't, is. so we shouldn't be drinking milk and we shouldn't be eating uh, eating meat. No, I don't think so. I mean, in particular, wow. I mean, putting aside the factory farming case, I mean, you know, when 70-odd percent, 71 percent plus of British farm animals are factory farmed in increasingly in very large mega farms. Um, so the sort of picture we have of the sort of rural idyll is, isn't very accurate. Um, but even without that, I think, you know, you're still violating an animal's rights, even if it's brought up and it lives a reasonably happy life to then simply kill it for your for your benefit. But OK, so that's uh, the ethical question here is if they, uh, as you say, they're leading a you know, reasonably happy life and then all of a sudden uh, it ends rather abruptly. I mean, they're presumably not aware of that. Maybe they are. Maybe they you know, there's talk amongst them on the in the field uh, about how they're ultimately going to be slaughtered. But I mean, if if they don't know that. Uh, I mean, if if they if that wasn't their end purpose, they wouldn't have existed in the first place. If they're having a happy life in the meantime, yeah. big question there's, mark. There's two things going on there. Um, one is the sort of how much do we know about the sort of minds of of cattle? Do they have future directed goals, for example? And we, we know they're actually more sophisticated than most people think. And in fact, there's lots of psychological evidence that the the people tend to downplay the the cognitive sophistication of animals they want to eat, <laughs> and they'll ignore evidence about how sophisticated they are because it's very convenient for us to do that um, cows are you know they're co- they have complex relationships they're capable of grieving um they form friendships they have preferred grooming partners uh, they have preferred feeding partners um they have individual personalities there are studies that show they're either more optimistic or pessimistic so you'll get ones that are more fearful and others that are more curious um so they have quite sophisticated lives they look forward to the future they they have memories of the past uh, anyone who's worked with with cows will know this um, so there's the sort of level of sophistication that says they, they do have an interest in the future and they have an identity that persists over time and they have preferences directed towards that. And so when we kill them, it, it, it's bad for them because it cuts off the possibility of them enjoying those future uh, pleasures. So so you're, you're thinking really we are going to get to a point pretty soon where ethically we will all have to be vegetarian. I mean, there's just no way to have animal rights in any meaningful sense without reaching that point. Well... Potentially, right? Um, so, and I think technology might have a different answer for here. Um, I think farming as a pra- as a practice now is unethical. Um, it can't be done without causing severe suffering or uh, different forms of harm, like killing. Can't be. You can't. You can't raise cows, social beings, without disrupting their relationships in very serious ways, um, separating them from their children and their friends, and moving them around, and then killing them and causing them to suffer. But the the, the 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 science at the moment is pushing us towards increasing capability of manufacturing animal proteins, milk, eggs, meat in bioreactors, lab grown meats, without any real harm to non human animals. Mm. So I think possibly harm to the environment. We don't know yet whether that yeah, that, that's possible. But at the moment, the mm. evidence is suggesting that the environmental footprint of those technologies is much less than particularly industrial farming as we practice it now. I've been looking at. I'm looking at a study from the University of Oxford. I mean, it's from a few years ago, so maybe it's advanced. 
arguing that cultivated meat actually could release more greenhouse gases than t- traditional farming. Well, so, but, but there so, may be ways in which that can be adjusted, and, and then that's a whole issue about climate rather than yes, the it's rights, not an animal rights issue. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a different kind of ethical it's a science, scientific. It's a science issue that where you don't want to go. Absolutely. Well, that's, I'm fair, fair enough. You yeah. know, let, let, let's keep. It. But one of the things we've, we've spoken about pets, we've spoken about farm animals, but what about wildlife, Steve? Because that's a whole other thing. The extent to which, for example, we encroach on wildlife's habitats we uh, get rid of wildlife in certain cases you know th- that's a whole other relationship isn't it yes yeah and it's a really interesting difficult philosophically uh, uh, relationship as well I, I i tend to think there are certain kinds of animals that can only live in particular habitats they can't live good lives unless they have a very particular habitat and so i think the the, the interest they have in that habitat will generate rights to that habitat um, other other animals can exist in all sorts of habitats, um, and perhaps that might not generate a right to a particular habitat, but you know they would still have fundamental rights, I think, in the same way that I think we have rights to distant strangers, people we don't know on the other side of the globe, we've never met, we haven't got any particular family or close relationship, we don't know them, we still owe them something. Um, we still we still think they ought to have rights. And I think the same is true of of wild animals, free roaming animals. They, they have rights to be able to live out their lives and flourish. And that means when it comes to our relationships with them, we ought to change the way we behave. Um, and some of those animals like living amongst us. Um, there's a, a couple of political theorists, Sue, Sue Donalds and Will Kimlick, have written a, a great book called Zoo, Zoopolis or Zoopolis um, that talks about thinking of wild animals as separate sort of sovereign communities almost. Um, and those kind of animals that enter into our spheres as almost like migrant workers or uh, migrant travelers. And we should make accommodations in our own communities to allow them to pass through safely um, or to divert them where they're a threat to us or something like that. So all of this is all of this relates to the expansion of the human being as a species, doesn't it? That we mm. are growing in number, we're taking over more territory around the world. So that means that we are relying on animals for food. We are also encroaching on their natural environment and uh, and taking away some of that environment. It seems like the only way to, you know, to, to solve all of that is for there to be less humans. I mean, ultimately, I, I wonder whether any of this can be done while the human race continues to expand in the uh, in the numbers that it currently is. Yeah, because we, we inevitably encroach, don't we, Steve? I mean, and then, and that's, then you balance human rights against animal rights almost in a legal sense, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I, I'm not the kind of misanthropic animal rights theorist who think we should get... Have fewer humans. I'm very uncomfortable about that kind of approach to thinking, thinking about uh, animal rights, and particularly because it often um, directs blame for population problems onto the, the the least advantaged people in the world in the global south, um, and particularly upon women. And I, I think there's something somewhat distasteful about that way of thinking. Um, I, I would say that you know an awful lot of our demands for land come from our demands for animal agriculture. So vast swathes of, of the Amazon, for example, are chopped down to grow soya in order to feed cattle, beef cattle in particular. Um, so a lot of our agricultural land, lots of use of our water, enormous amounts of water and land are used in animal agriculture. And it's quite inefficient um, in that we're converting animal protein, uh, we're converting plant protein into animal protein, which we then consume. And we could we could have lots more space and feed a lot more people with Far fewer animals. Right. So, they, so, they, so that cattle just wouldn't exist, or just we might have a few roaming the countryside, leading, yeah. uh, you know, m- meeting, well, meeting m- much as they would have been before we, we started farming. Well, there's still a wild oxen here and yeah. there, just uh, yeah. Uh, with, but, 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 but I mean, how do we get there? I mean, that's the point. I mean, do we just stop breeding them? Do we? Yeah. I mean, this is the tricky you know, bit, right? This, this is, is a transition question in all this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of focused on the persuading people first, and then worrying about the transition later. But there are lots of ways we could do this i mean and and most people working in this field will say that the process ought to be gradual um you can't just suddenly end everything tomorrow and it's not likely to happen anyway it's not really a consideration that we would likely face but you could for example um just cease deliberately breeding non-human animals those processes are very invasive and aggressive at the moment the way we breed farm animals if you've ever been near a farm it's 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 not a you know pleasant happy let's some animals get together and have some fun times um the artificial insemination process is is often pretty brutal um and very systematized um but you could you could gradually i think we'd be gradually thinking about reducing numbers breeding breathing them out maybe using contraceptions that kind of 
approach rather than just leaving everything as it is and letting them roam but, wild. But, but Steve, the point, the impetus for all that is going to have to be legal, isn't it? it, it that's the only way forward. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is another interesting aspect of all this, which is when we talk about rights, you talk in a way about how those rights can be enforced um, and and that's going to involve yeah. the courts. I mean, you're going to have a situation where a you know a cow is represented by a barrister in court. It it seems bizarre in a way that we're bringing animals into court. Fantastic like for that. the legal profession, isn't it? I mean, they will make a monster <laughs> out of all of this. Yes, yes. I mean, that's the point of fundamental rights, though, isn't it? They are um, enforceable. Um, when we when we violate someone's rights, we're doing them a serious wrong, and it's the kind of wrong that's important enough. Um, to justify the use of coercion to protect that right. And this is the fundamental argument about animal rights, that they have these kind of really strong interests that justify us using legal protections so we're, to prevent people making not a, a preference. Now, look, I mean, it's, I think it's easy for cows. You know, if you, if you could talk to them and say, you know, uh, are you happy with the whole artificial insemination thing so that you can uh, breed children who ultimately get slaughtered to feed humans? A, a cow would probably go, yeah, that's not quite such a good deal. Not particularly happy about that. Yeah. Uh, no, no, but but, only the, but, the pessimistic cows were. The optimistic cows might, 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 might be happy. Well, I might escape <laughs> and form a whole new life for myself absolutely uh, or we'll fight yeah. for rights uh, and then everything is going to be hunky dory but i mean uh, i'm looking at my slave cat uh, if he was if he was let loose, he would run to the main road just around the corner and uh, probably go run over by a car. And uh, so would all mm. the other cats who were sort of let loose. And same for dogs. Well, I tell you what else your cat would do. He'd probably rush out and find the nearest bird that he could find and violate that bird's rights pretty dramatically, wouldn't yeah. he? Because well, he's, he's already the, done that. Yeah. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah, and that, so that's that, another interesting point of this, Steve, which mm. is rights and duties. There's a kind of idea yeah. that you don't have rights unless you also have duties. Well, so, yeah, and that's, uh, that's it. And then you get to the question about yeah these animals uh, if we're if we're imposing our our um, architecture our legal architecture on them to say well these are the, you know we're going to give you the rights that we give to well similar to the sorts of rights that we give to other humans we should be saying to them but you have to do the same thing as well so if we're not going to kill you you can't kill anything else and then you, and of course, you're going yeah, against the laws of nature there. And in the Middle and Ages, of course, they did put animals on trial, famously. They, they, various points. they also put statues, swords and all sorts of other things on trial. And they were wrong to do so. Um, and I, I think we can sort of deal with this, this question by going back to the analogy with children. Um, very commonly, people think rights and duties uh, have to go together. You can't have a right unless you can exercise unless you can also perform a duty. And that isn't the case. It's not how our legal system works. Um, we think about Children in particular, we think they have rights whether or not they have duties, right? We don't hold them to the same criminal standard for that reason because they don't have the capacity to control uh, their desires in the same way. They don't have reason. And the same is true of non-human animals. So a, a, a cat that kills a bird isn't violating the bird's rights. Um, it's harming the bird, um, and perhaps as our guardian, as the guardian of your cat, you might have duties to prevent your cat from causing too much serious harm. Um, so you might be required to rescue that bird, for example. That's something we commonly do if we if we find our cat has caught something, we we rescue it. Um, so you might have a, a duty to maybe put a bell on your cat or or take reasonable precautions. But the cat isn't violating a right. It's not being held to a, a, a legal standard and being punished for that. It doesn't make sense to punish a cat because it it's doesn't have the ability to make moral choices. What about, so anglers, just as another example. I mean, there's a hundred mm-hmm. over 100,000 people in the UK go angling at the weekend. So should fishing be illegal? Is that taking away the rights of the fish? So yeah, I used to be one of those people a long, long time ago. Um, and I think it probably is. It probably is. It, you know, the, the, this, I mean, there's two, the course fishing where you were kind of be releasing the fish is is going to be less less serious than if you're killing it but there's lots of good research now that suggests that fish are capable of feeling pain and have much more sophisticated uh, psychologies than than we realized um you know the science that's been developed to find this out is quite distressing some of it but uh, for example if you if you put some acid into a fish tank the fish gets sad and if you release an analgesic into the fish tank the fish get happier again um, and so we know they can feel <laughs> that's the sort of experiments that, that scientists where, do where does this all this end because I've heard a similar experiment where they said you know somebody uh, abused a plant a potted plant 
and uh, and when that same individual I don't know whether this is uh, folklore or not when that same individual came back into a room there was there was a reaction from all the other plants so where do, oh, where are we getting towards vegetable, vegetable plant, rights now plant, vegetable, exactly, rights, vegetable, vegetable rights, rights exactly yeah. how far can this go plants are capable of responding to their environment but there's no convincing evidence whatsoever that they're capable of feeling and this is what the sentience position is about it's about the capacity to feel uh, to experience emotions so for example if you if you touch a hot thing the first thing you do is your hand moves away and then momentarily afterwards you will get a feeling that's when you go ow that hurt um but that's that initial physiological shying away is known as nociception it's a, a physical response to a noxious stimuli a stimulus and plants might get that um but they don't have the feeling that comes later, the emotion of pain or something like that. Um, they don't have, and because of that, they don't have a, a sort of, there's no sense of what it's like to be a plant. Whereas there is a sense of what it's like to be a cat or a dog or a mouse. Those but, beings- but isn't that just our capacity to, to know what a plant is feeling rather than there actually being a fact that they don't feel? Isn't it just somewhere we just don't understand well, as yet? Perhaps? I mean, it's possible. Um, but that, that, that maybe there's some kind of feeling in there. But, you know, scientists will think, well, what is it that we know generates our capacity to feel? Um, well, for example, it's the behavior that we have. We can tell from behavior. or And we can look at the kind of physiological uh, requirements necessary, like having nerve endings, um, those kind of bodily elements that are connected with those feelings. And we can look for those in other animals. And when we spot them, we've got a good indication and then we can perform experiments to find out uh, and that will tell us. Um, I, I leave those questions to the to the scientists. But there is a, there is a, there is I an, think the ethical questions are kind of, you, yeah, they flow from them. But there is an irony in that you're saying, you know, we know that uh, fish react because if you pour acid into the water, we see them react. I mean, that is harming the fish, obviously, as, as part of that experiment. Mm. And then there are 70 million animals killed in experiments in the United States each year, 11 million in the EU. I'm not sure how many in the UK, but I'm sure it's up there as well. And scientists would yeah. say, well, we need to experiment. We need to test on animals uh, because it is impossible to recreate something as complex as the living body. You know, we need to see the reaction and we can't do that unless we, we're using live animals. And we've got, you know, half the uh, the disease in the world. Uh, currently, there's no treatment for it. So, you know, do we stop medical science because we don't want to experiment on animals any further? Yes. Which so is I'm, then a violation of human rights because they are not being helped in a way that we, feas- we feasibly could help them. Yeah, yeah. So I think there are several there's several kind of answers that we, we can make here. First, we could say, well, is it true that those kind of advances can, can't be made without the use of non-human animals? And recently, the American, uh, well, Biden signed a, a legal uh, instrument that said we don't America doesn't have to test on animals anymore. Um, the government in the UK has responded to a request for information from an animal rights group and agreed that that's not a legal requirement in the UK either. And there are scientific organizations like um, Animal Free Research UK that, that fund scientific research into non-animal based methods. Uh, computer modeling and things like that. And those advances are being made very rapidly at the moment. So we have a lot of capacity for doing the research without the use of animals. But I think even if it were true that we could only get them from non-human animals, it it wouldn't necessarily justify those kind of research activities because it would be a violation of rights. In order to say it's permissible, you have to first say, well, animals don't have rights, right? And you need to make that argument first. Um, and if they do have rights, then there are, you know, their the rights protect us from being used for the benefit of other people uh, or other beings. That's the nature of them. But, but uh, isn't there a hierarchy of rights, though? So you know, the rights are always going to conflict, and it has to be what the the higher of those rights are the the the, the one that supersedes the others, which. Perhaps yeah, naturally we would feel a human right. In some cases, you will get conflicts of rights, right? That doesn't mean that the person whose rights eventually are superseded doesn't have rights, and it doesn't mean that they can just be used for the benefit of another. And I'm thinking about cases where you've got forced choice cases where you can only save one person rather than two. Who do you save? Um, or you're in the, the classic example is the lifeboat cases where you're, you've got to throw someone overboard or you've got to eat someone uh, to survive and you've got to make a choice between a person and a dog or something like that. Then you, you're going to violate the dog's rights because the human's rights are stronger. But that doesn't mean, you know, as you're walking along the street and there's no forced choice like that, you just get to kill your dog. Um, so even though there's, there might be some cases where you're balancing rights in that way, 
the rights, the idea, the nature of a right is that it forbids you from using someone as a tool um, to achieve a social benefit. Um, and we might think that, you I mean, and there are lots of really emotive arguments about how much benefit we get from medical uh, testing. And I think those are good. Those are, those are powerful arguments. It, it, human well-being matters a lot. But if we, if we were just focused on well-being, for example, we could achieve massive amounts of increases in human happiness and well-being and health in very different ways. So for example, when I was a kid, I caught malaria. It's a, a terrible disease that kills an awful lot of people. And the most effective way of, of dealing with it very often is to buy mosquito nets. They cost a few dollars. If we were to spend the kind of money that we spend on animal testing on buying some mosquito nets, improving sanitation, um, ensuring access to clean water and good nutrition, we'd have much better health outcomes. Um, so it, it's a little bit disingenuous, I think, to just focus on you know, particular and medical advances as if that's all, all, the only way to achieve, you know, great benefits. All right. One, one final question then. 10,000, it may be a little less than this, but, you know, because this is, I mean, who knows, but 10,000 species, let's say that, disappear mm -hmm. each year. Now, some of them, you know, are microorganisms, which perhaps, you know, aren't as sentient or aren't sentient. You're probably but, not. <laughs> so, but where do you draw the line? You know, it's it's, uh, and, and how much of that is because getting back to this whole argument about us encroaching on so much more of the world, and so are we taking away the rights of animals, like koala bears, for example, or you know, because we're chopping down trees, uh, and uh, so do we stop chopping down trees? Do we stop encroaching? Do we put limits on how much of the wildlife habitat that we that we actually invade? Uh, because otherwise, that would be an invasion of their rights. We're taking away their land. Yeah, so the answer, I think, is 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 largely yes. We we stop a lot of that thing, but I also think it's possible for us to live you know, to coexist um, and to live well alongside many of these these other species in ways that don't violate their rights. So I could imagine perhaps koalas have a protected place um, where their trees are, are kept safe. Um, and for example, we could, the human communities could still go in there and enjoy that space. They might even be able to practice some logging provided they then planted some new trees and made sure there was sufficient left over for koalas to enjoy. Um, and if we were going to have to build a road between that space, we would plant a few more trees on the other side of the road and then let the koalas to move over to there. So I think it's possible to to live alongside. There are always going to be difficult cases, but there are in human existences. We have conflicts between communities and individuals in those communities all the time. Um, and we rely upon you know, judges to make decisions and politicians to make decisions about how to balance. And, and that's what it should be. It should be rights decided in court by judges should be the mm -hmm. basis of our relationship with with, with well, so constitutional generally. protections, I think first of all, and then then when there are clashes, it's up for mediation or courts. And we have systems in place that already do this. I mean, and I find this quite baffling myself. Um, but there are legal guardians protected in the constitution for already for, for rivers, for mountains, forests, ecosystems in different jurisdictions, some of them in, in like the Canadian legal system is very similar to ours. And they've managed to have those kind of protections in place where you might have someone constitutionally appointed to represent the interests of all the rivers. Uh, and they will speak on their behalf in, in a court. If we can do yeah. that for rivers, I think we can manage it for a chimpanzee. Well, there we are. We've reached the point. River rights, vegetable rights, and animal rights. We seem I'm to cross, I'm, and... I'm, 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 I'm drawing a line at vegetable rights. I don't, all right, I don't think all right. The river rights, anyway, or mountain rights, too. I'm not um, convinced by those, but yes. We've got to keep the vegetables. We've got to be able to eat something. Let's keep the vegetables. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> good, right. good to talk, Steve. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much indeed. I tell you what, he has got a uh, a big job ahead of him. If he's I think persuasion-wise, you could be right, but uh, yeah, a I massive. I mean, he's calling for a massive change. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, first of all, telling everyone. I mean, I think a lot of this will just happen anyway. Through you know, uh, well, we, so many people, so many young people are vegan or vegetarian. You yeah. know, there's kind of. Uh, that that's out there, and I, and I think I think the interesting idea that this could all be legally enshrined is 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 well, that's going to be a bigger hurdle. I think. Yeah, I think a lot of it is already. Is now, I mean, you can't you know uh, hurt animals, uh, your pets, for example. What I thought mm. was interesting, I mean, and we've all got double standards in this. When I was uh, researching for this, I looked at uh, a, a website in in uh, the United States where it's sort of like talking about uh, experiments on animals, 
And actually, sorry, it was in Germany. One and a half million yeah. mice are experimented each year uh, in Germany. Mm. And 765 cats. So here's, here's me. I was, you know, wasn't mortified at the thought of one and a half million mice, but the fact that 765 cats. And then That's on this website, it's got a picture of a cat having an experiment performed on it with an electrode. It's got oh. things oh. bolted into its head. And I'm thinking, that's a cat. Why should I care more about a cat? Well, obviously, because I've got yeah. a cat that I love. Uh, yeah, yeah. And almost 4,000 dogs. There would, you know, there would be many people appalled at the idea yeah. of experiments on dogs as well, because we have an well, affinity. Well, that's the thing. And if you enshrine rights, you have to have rights. You know, I think if a cat is sentient, then a mouse certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can't really say it isn't. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, as you say, of double standards. And, and I mean, it was interesting also his point about how you, you know, that we are encro by encroaching on land, we're encroaching on animal rights yeah. too. Well, that's what I was trying to make that, you know, maybe we need to hold off. But, you know, that then we need to, re you know, rein in our population growth, which he didn't seem to think was something uh, we necessarily you're keen on that one. Did. Yeah. But anyway, look, next week, um, something else well, is. Well, this, this encroachment is all part of it in a way because. Well, well it's destroying the planet, isn't it? It's how much we rely on fossil fuels and how much more we're going to need. And more importantly, whether the UK should be opening up new oil fields and gas fields when we're As trying the government to, is intending to do. To do. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, are we, despite everything, for the foreseeable future, going to have to have fossil fuels as part of the mix? And if we are... Is it reasonable that we should take our own and, and put it in? Does it actually but, make much difference if it comes out of the well, North Sea? And I don't think it matters where it comes from, does it? Because it's an mm. international marketplace, and, and if it's oil, we have to send it overseas to, uh, unless we're going to start building oil refineries, it's got to be sent overseas to be refined anyway, where it goes into the big pool of you know international mm. oil, uh, and we buy it at the international price, irrespective yeah. of where it comes from. I mean, we'll get a bit of money from tax revenue and the like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is there a bit but, of jingoism, really? And, oh, let's open up the oil for our own benefit. Yeah, and... And I'd be interested in finding out next week as well, actually, how quickly that can happen. Because, I, you know, I'm mm. hearing murmurs that, well, you know, it could take 10 or 20 years, uh, mm. by which time it perhaps won't be needed anyway. Well, so one would hope is, that renewables will have, will have replaced a lot of it. But yeah. mm. so we'll get, we'll get the lay down on this. Next we'll, week on we'll the drill into it, you might even the say. Drill, God, yeah, there we are. Thank Come you. Uh, I think we should finish on a high and just finish on that. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. The Why Curve.